Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Joao Cavalcante uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. He's a true multimodality imager and um, an expert in MR, CT, echo, and you name it. Joao, it's great to have you among us, and we're looking forward for your views on cardiac MR. Thank you, Bill, for the kind introduction, and it's really a true honor uh, to be here, part of this very distinguished faculty panel, and also to such a very well-organized and beautiful institution. I have to echo uh, Randy's comments about you know, the impressiveness and very thrilled to be here for the first time. So over the next 50 minutes, I was tasked to talk about you know, the basic concept of uh, cardiac MRI and the new developments. Uh, these are my disclosures. And we will look into how the images are acquired. How can we obtain that? What do we need? What is the versatility that MRI can provide? As well as some very exciting new developments. And this might be just a teaser because there's so much to talk about that could be the whole symposium about that. So the general principle about cardiac MR is that water is the most abundant component in our body. If you look at water is where we live and that's what we're composed of. About 70% of our body is made out of water. And guess what? This is actually very helpful when we want to create the images. Why is that? Because these hydrogen protons, then we're going to magnetize. We use our own source of water to magnetize these protons and manipulate them whichever way we want. How does that work? Take, for example, this video. We put a patient in a magnet. Patient is going to have his head on the north pole and then the south pole. These protons are going to be precessing, precessing this wobbling movement. What is shown here is what we call radio frequency pulse, which is a creation of a secondary magnetic field. It was sent to the 90 degrees. Now they're listening to that 90 degrees radio frequency pulse. It's a second magnetic field. Once that radio frequency pulse is terminated, they're going to return to their original state, to the North Pole. As you can see, as they return to the North Pole, they're going to release energy. And they do not come at the same time. And that's because they're intrinsic tissue properties in each single space. The release of that signal, of that energy, is what is going to create the imaging signal that we're going to see as an image. So I spent almost two minutes to talk about how we get the images here, but this occurs in milliseconds. So that's why it's so fascinating. So how do we obtain these images? We need to have a patient, and a patient that is cooperative and that fits into the magnet. So in our case here, <laughs> so don't try to squeeze. It is, <laughs> then it's not going it to go too issue. far, and you're not going to have luck into that. So uh, Siemens, uh, here we use a magnetum spree, which is a 70 centimeter board to accommodate the Pittsburgh patients, uh, which I think will be similar here in Texas. Uh, we need to have. <laughs> A body coil, this body coil is what is going to actually capture those signals from different spots in the body and is going to recreate this, the image very quickly. <clears throat> and to that, we need to have a trained technologist that is going to be providing the instructions to the patients, the breath holding, and we should be sitting next to them because this is a very live and dynamic study. We cannot just be you know, doing other things because once the images are acquired, you cannot go back. So you've got to be there and be able to answer the question. This is what we call the vector ECG. That's how we obtain the EKG signal to synchronize the cardiac motion. That's why it makes cardiac MRI very unique as compared to brain, uh, knee, um, and back, and other MRIs. And depending on the pulse sequence, we might need to also trigger the motion according to the diaphragmatic motion to have 3D as I would see. So a word of caution is that the magnet is always on, and we need to respect that. There was probably in the social media you might have heard about in a tra tragic case in India very recently in which a patient was in a wheelchair and then was sucked in into the magnet. Uh, it still happens, unfortunately. And so there are lines actually surrounding the magnet that you cannot come close to that. So be mindful of that. You cannot turn it off. If you turn it off, it's going to be a huge expense to power this magnet back up. Mm -hmm. So cerebral aneurysm clips are contraindicated, pulmonary artery catheters, cochlear implants, and metallic uh, foreign bodies. As far as pacemaker and ICDs, actually, this is a very ra rapidly uh, evolving field because not only we have approved MRI conditional pacemakers and ICDs that we are fine to do, but even the older ones, the legacy devices, have been shown actually to be fairly safe and okay to be used. It's actually much more the artifacts that can be generated from the inhomogeneity that that device is going to create into the magnetic field. It's going to distort the currents. Prosthetic valves, 
something that we do routinely, especially the Tavra valves are fair game. The only thing would be the pre-1968 Star Edwards valve. And severe renal impairment would not be a contraindication for cardiac MR, but rather for the gadolinium use, given the risk for nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which actually has almost disappeared. So the versatility of cardiac MR um, comes with the capability of probing several processes. So for example, you take things such as valvular heart disease, which is something that is very near, dear my heart. We can look at the valve function. We can look at uh, cardiac remodeling. We can look at not only a function, but we can look at deformation as well now from cine images. We can look at structural remodeling and track this response over time. We can measure flow and velocities, particularly for regurgitant lesions. We can look at coronary artery disease and myocardial perfusion abnormalities. We can look at 3D anatomy, similar to CT, with a very close to CT, I would say, not nearly isotropic voxel, but we have been using this in selected patients as TAVR planning because we do not require intravenous contrast. So that's the beauty of that. You know, patients would have advanced chronic kidney disease would do TAVR planning with the CMR. And the tissue characterization as well that you know, has been really exploding the field with the capability of measure how much fibrosis there is there with the T1 mapping, T2 mapping for myocardial edema, inflammation, as well as replacement fibrosis, the late gadolinium enhancement, as you have heard before and we will touch upon, as well as this diffuse fibrosis, which is the extracellular volume fraction, which is a new field as well. So in order to obtain all this information, we need to obviously be manipulating this proton several ways. And this will take, obviously, some uh, uh, training and some expertise that you need to develop. I will not have, obviously, time to go through that. But if we want to, uh, for example, see this lipomatous hypertrophy here, which is made predominantly out of fat, this is a fat-based image. And we can saturate that fat with the proper pulse sequence. And that confirms, indeed, that you're dealing with brown fat. Spin echo black blood images were actually how cardiac MRI started about 20 years ago, nearly now. This was just static images, but provided us a very good anatomical. And then the development of gradient echo sequences, CINE, that now we can see things in motion. We can measure flow, and we can do 3D um, um, reconstruction similar to CT. Quantification of ventricular function is something that uh, MRI is considered to be the gold standard. Uh, this is uh, here the recent uh, regurgitation uh, valvula guidelines by ASC led by Dr. Zogby showing that if we know what the area is and we know what the slice thickness is, now we have volume. And if we have the end diastolic and end systolic volume, we can quantitate the ventricular function and stroke volume. And this is particularly helpful uh, for right ventricle. As we can see it here in this patient that had prior mitral valve a replacement mechanical valve and now comes in with significant right-sided symptoms, tricuspid valve regurgitation, complete coaptation, and RV dilation. And we can quantitate this ventricular remodeling and quantitate also the severity of tricuspid regurgitation. Just a couple brief words on myocardial delayed enhancement, going back to the question that Dr. Zogby asked uh, before. The transmural, how much of that transmural enhancement is there, will predict the functional recovery after coronary revascularization. If you have a transmural infarct that goes throughout the whole segment, that predicts pretty much that this is dead. You're not going to revascularize, not going to invest time into that bypass. But if you have a wall that it has less than 25, for example, in this case here, more than 80% of these patients would have very good functional recovery and therefore the role of myocardial viability. Valvular disease uh, is also another hot topic, and particularly as we try to develop better thresholds and use of cardiac MR, and particularly uh, for aortic regurgitation, which is something that we struggle with echocardiography. It's important, obviously, to respect and do a proper image acquisition, the slice plane that we need to interrogate at the aortic root that calculates the flow upwards in systole and then the flow backwards. So this area under the curve here will be corresponding to the regurgitation volume and the regurgitant fraction that we can calculate precisely. And to finish, here's some new developments, things that are coming really now on the daily practice and things that are coming down the pike. Scanning patients with pacemaker and defibrillators, as we talked about, this is a patient that came to our lab about a month ago with an ICD um, device, which was MRI compatible. As we can see, there is actually artifact from infield inhomogeneity created by the generator. This patient had on the right side 
and uh, it created even some artifact. There are development of pulse sequences called the wide band, both for CINE as well as for late gadolinium enhancement. This is a work from the group at the University of Utah. As you can see, with the standard late gadolinium enhancement, it cannot resolve at all that anterior wall. And with the wide band pulse sequence, now you have signal back. And that allows us, for these patients that actually I would argue are the most vulnerable, are the ones that would benefit the most from cardiac MRI, up until now we, cannot, we could not image these patients. Mm -hmm. Some other uh, interesting developments also come in with very uh, simple post-processing. The use of feature tracking, strain imaging on regular cine images is now feasible. Uh, there is actually very good competition between two companies. TomTech started now, was bought by Metas. Uh, actually, their software and now Metis has licensed, and also we have Circle uh, is using that. And this has made some very good um, capability of doing strain imaging on regular cine. This used to be required to uh, be done using special pulse sequences such as myocardial tagging, which was not only time consuming for acquisition, but for post processing. And now we can do with just the sim images that we will require uh, on a conventional clinical basis. 4D flow is something that is also, uh, you're going to hear a lot about it. Uh, this is a courtesy of one of our collaborators, Mike Hope from UCSF, was one of the pioneers as well into this. Uh, this acquisition takes about 10 to 15 minutes and then is averaging over 1,000 heartbeats, as you can see, to create these path lines and to analyze flow disturbance. You can see there's a little bit of regurgitation at the very end here and the displacement of this uh, particles that can be done. Why could this be important? And particularly, this a lot of interest. This is from the group at uh, Northwestern. Alex Barker and Mike Marco have been pioneers. They have a very close relationship with Siemens there. And they're trying to understand whether patients that would have bicuspid aortic valve, this flow pattern, and the increased wall shear stress could be a contributor to the development of aortopathy. These are bicuspid aortic valves that actually do not even have a stenosis. Just the intrinsic nature of the opening of the valve creates a flow uh, profile that is uh, abnormal. And by doing that, you create another push into that aorta that might contribute in part to the development of aortopathy. Other applications that also have been reviewed by Mike Marco would be the, um, and this is now feasible on echocardiography with the new uh, GE software for um, blood speckle imaging. And these are now particles that we can look at the direct flow, the retained flow, the delayed ejection that would give us a lot of insights about, you know, the suctioning of the blood. It's going to give us insight about potentially diastology, perturbations of intramyocardial blood flow after prosthesis. There are many other things that we could potentially probe once we can uh, you know, optimize not only that acquisition, but especially post-processing. On the left side here, also some new developments in terms of acquisition. So this same thing concept about 4D flow, if we gate according to the diaphragm diaphragmatic motion, we would have data sets similar to CT. Not only now we can have a whole entire 3D data set, and in the acid, but we can quantitate flow as well, as you can see in this patient with the aortic insufficiency. You can see that there is a trade-off. The spatial resolution, the image quality is not as crisp, and the temporal resolution is not so um, crisp as the regular breath hold. But nonetheless, this could be a one-stop shop. We press the button, let the patient breathe in and out 20 minutes, you grab a cough, you come back, and voila, <laughs> you have it. That's a lofty go, isn't it? We're not quite there. But that's at least you know, pushing the envelope. On the right panel, you would see this is a, a CASA Pi Medical from the Netherlands. We're working with them as well with 4G flow and looking at annulus tracking. This particularly for the application of valvular heart disease in which we will be able to track the annular displacement, the motion throughout the cardiac cycle and measure flow at any given plane. Uh, some applications that in collaboration with Dr. Kelman from our lab have been now into the development of post-processing using cloud-based systems. So this is an Amazon computer, more than 25 computers. They are post-processing this very quick acquisition. We let patients actually breathe. This is the concept that we can do cardiac MRI in patients that are actually the most vulnerable, patients with the large pericardial effusion and pleur large pleural fusion, small pericardial fusion, you can see that the, the, the diaphragm is moving up and down. And the temporal resolution here is as good, if not better, than um, with the regular uh, breath hold. And 
there is actually software to freeze the diaphragmatic motion, so you can do tracking and tracing and everything. So this is thanks to developments and techniques. And one thing here that I'm sure that the, the group from the Methodist has been using is the fiddle, is the flow independent dark blood delayed enhancement. This is a development that came from the group from Dr. Kim at Duke, but trying to actually better visualize subendocardial infarct because the blood, the blood pool on the delayed enhancement is bright. Sometimes you might miss a small myocardial infarctions. And when you have the blood pool being dark, it's a dark blood image, you can see this small subendocardial infarct. So better um, confidence intervals. So in conclusions, I hope to have shown that CMR is a quite versatile tool with real-time imaging. We're moving into faster acquisition protocols, letting patients breathe, and actually improving the acceptance with multiple patients with devices and things like that. And this continued partnership between physicians, bioengineers, and physicists will certainly drive the technological developments that will continue to expand the use of CMR. Thank you very much.